Reverend Istu Danaba is the founder and president of the Istu Danaba Ministries EAM, headquartered in Bolgatanga and the Upper East Region of Ghana. Istu Danaba Ministries is dedicated to influencing the body of Christ to be a repositioned and revived people of God ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He and his wife Rosemond serve as the senior pastorate of the Desert Pastures, Fountain Gate Chapel, Bolgatanga. Fountain Gate Chapel is a people-oriented and missions-hearted ministry with over 300 member churches worldwide. Pastor Eastwood is a revivalist with an uncompromising message on the Holy Ghost, righteousness, discipline, and order in the body of Christ with a powerful emphasis on the love of God. He has authored 104 books including God's Anti-Time Militia, The Love Revolution, Humility, and Four Kinds. Church, with a standing ovation, let's welcome Reverend Istu Danaba. Praise the Lord. Shall we lift up our hands to Jesus and bless him tonight, give him glory and honor. Father, we give you praise. We magnify your name. We ask that your spirit will move in our midst tonight. We pray for the mighty power of God to manifest itself, that your holy name should be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and God bless you. Amen. Well, um, I will start by saying, at long last, I'm in the great... Um, Agape House. <laughs> you know, um, this, is, this is a church you hear about again and again and again with a unique man of God anointed by God to provide something in the body of Christ which is normally not common. And we thank God for Reverend Whitcomb's life and his wife Donna. God mightily bless you. And we, we, we are so honored and so blessed to be in this house tonight, um, my wife and I, and we came with a great team seated behind us. The Lord bless all of you. Now, um, for, I want to, for tonight and tomorrow, I'll be teaching on a very simple subject, and the subject is called humility humility. Now this is, this is the, this is the lead, the lead conference and um, it will be good for us to talk about humility. Humility is one of my latest books I've written and that is the book you can, you can, you can find one when we close and then um, go to the bookstand, you can get a copy of the book on humility and you get it and read it. Um, humility is a, I call it the least virtue, I call it the last virtue, and I also call it the lost virtue. It is the least, it is the last, and it is the lost. Um, in our world today, nobody talks about humility. Yet, humility is one of the cardinal virtues that Jesus had when he walked the earth. We have a very serious problem when it comes to humility. And Paul, writing to the Philippians, said that, let this mind, Philippians 2, 5. He said, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and being, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And the Bible said in the next verse, which is the verse number nine, wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is higher than every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things on earth, of things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I want to pick from the verse number five to eight tonight, and then tomorrow 
I do from verse 9 to about 11. So he said, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. And the mind that was in Christ Jesus was a mind of humility. The, the whole of this text, from the verse number 5 to number 8, speaks about the humility of Jesus. That he had a certain mind, and the mind was that being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself rather of no reputation. So Jesus Christ, he said, I and the Father are one. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. The Bible said without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifested in the flesh. Yet he came to the earth. And when he came, the Bible said it was not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Now, that, those words, to make yourself of no reputation, in the Greek is, is a word that, is, um, that, that simply means to empty yourself. To empty yourself. So, when Jesus came into the world, he emptied himself. What is debatable is, of what did he empty himself? It is believed that he emptied himself of his um, outward manifest glory as God. So Jesus didn't walk about on earth shining with that blistering light and you can't approach him. So he minimized that. He, he emptied himself of that. And then he limited his powers of omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. So there were times you could literally see weakness in him. Tempted in every point like you and I, he could be hungry, he could be thirsty, he was born of a woman, he subjected himself to the growth process like all of us have to grow. He was just human like us. And he was made in the likeness of men, took upon him the form of a servant. And the Bible said, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him. Today, in all this, um, there is a seven-step process in the self-emptying of Jesus. Step number one, he made himself of no reputation. Step number two, took upon himself the form who was made in the likeness of men. I beg your pardon. So he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, number two. Number three, made in the likeness of men. Number four, found in fashion as a man. Number five, humbled himself. Number six, became obedient unto death. Number seven, even the death of the cross. So that is the seven step self-emptying process of Jesus. And the theologians, some, theolog some theologians call it the kenosis of Jesus. The kenosis of Jesus. The process by which Jesus Christ emptied himself of literally his powers of deity and became a man just so that he can save us. Now, it's so strange that Jesus Christ as a servant of God in trying to save us emptied himself. But we are very busy trying to fill ourselves with things that are not necessary. In fact, what he emptied himself of, we try to put in ourselves. And so, at, at last, you, you, have, you have churches, you have churches where both leaders and members are so full of pride. And, and this evening, when I was coming to teach, the, the Lord just led me to, I, I mean, they, this thing is a whole big thing. I told you, it's, it's a whole book. But the Lord led me tonight in this particular conference to just speak on obedient unto death. And I cannot do the death aspect, but I want to just talk about obedience. Obedience. Obedience is a word that is very offensive. I realize that anytime you receive a command, or somebody tells you something to do, immediately anger comes up in you. And you feel like telling a person, who do you think you are? 
You want to send me? You want to give me an instruction? You want to command me? Who are you? That word obedient in the English dictionary means compliance with an order, request, law, or submission to another person's authority. Now, if you want, you can even say submission to another person's wishes. And obedience is not easy for many people. Because when you obey somebody, it's almost like you are admitting that the person is superior to you and you are inferior. That, that, that is the thing that comes up in you. Okay. And that word obedience in the Greek, it is a word that means to give an ear, to be obedient, to attentive, attentively listen and be submissive. Now, so you see that in terms of the Greek understanding of obedience, it doesn't start with doing something. You see, the, the word obedience from the Greek doesn't seem to suggest doing something. It suggests listening to something. Okay? No, no, no. Watch this. Watch this. You, you, you. So, the word means to give ear, to attentively listen, and to be submissive. We are not told it said do something. Many people, for many people, obedience means do something. So they say do before you complain. Now, many people, the reason they cannot do is because they don't listen. Today, we, we learned a very le good lesson when my wife and I visited a medical officer. We have a medical officer who is our sister. And when we visited her, she's married to this very intelligent man. And she said, when you are speaking to the man, a lot of times, what he's telling you, you will get irritated from the beginning unless you listen to him well she said the man doesn't say this what he's saying he goes around the point and he paints a picture for you and you must be patient in listening to him then when you listen to him he has painted a picture for you and after painting the picture it is very e easy for you to do what he's saying and you will do it without offense Now, so reason many people are not obedient is they are bad listeners. That is why we send people and they do the opposite thing. No, sometimes you can tell people, bring me the cup, and they bring you a book. You tell them, stand up, and they sit down because they were not listening. Obedience begins with listening than doing. If you shall diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Many people are poor listeners. Listen, your ears must go ahead of your legs. Your ears must go ahead of your legs. But you see, unfortunately, God made your ears static to trick you. You see that your ears, they don't move. But I'm telling you, if your hands and your legs are faster than your ears, you'll be destroyed. You will be destroyed. So the Bible said, be swift to hear and slow to speak. But you listen, you, you realize your lips move, your tongue, it moves. But your ears, you don't hear anything moving. But that is what controls what you say, what you do, what you think, where you go, and who you are. Listening. So in the Bible, it will say, hear what the Spirit is saying. Then Jesus will speak all those things and finish. And he says, and let him that has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying. 
your ears. Listen. 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 So, obedience is not synonymous with doing. Obedience is synonymous with hearing well. And that is why when you have a wise person who is speaking to you, don't break them in the middle. Wait for them to finish speaking before you interject with your foolishness. <laughs> Don't mind the use of some of my words. I grew up in an army barracks and in Sabo Zongo and partly in Nima. Those are the places I grew up. Listen. Obedience. So, people talk about the anointing of Jesus. They want to be like Jesus there. His power, his anointing. They want to be like him. Now when Jesus came into the world, the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 10, the verse number 5 to 9. Hebrews 10, 5 to 9. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So, okay, let me take the whole thing, then I'll come back. Okay, verse number six. He said, a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and in sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the books it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which were offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now, so the first was that they took animals like sheep, like goats, like bulls, like turtle doves, and then they offered to God in sacrifice. And Jesus is saying, he didn't come to the world to take something and give to God. He came to the world to give himself. So he himself came as a sacrifice. He didn't come to offer sacrifices. He came to offer himself as a sacrifice because he's the one that is prepared. And he has come to offer himself as the sacrifice. And he's offering himself as the sacrifice in accordance with the prescription of God. So I come to do thy will, O oh God. I've come to do thy will. I've come to do what you sent me to do, not my own will. The Bible said that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a holy sacrifice. As he said that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. I remember years ago, I had a friend who had to go into ministry. And... Um, for years, God wanted him on full-time ministry, serve God full-time. And this man kept, I'll do it today, I won't do it tomorrow, you know. Because, you know, I like the people who normally say, all these young men who have stopped the work they are doing, and they are preaching full-time, instead of going to find some work to do, you see them preaching because they think, because they know that opening a church is the quickest way of getting money. If it's the quickest, go and try it. Listen, if you want madness without provocation, become a pastor. Madness without provocation, become a pastor. No, you, you, become, you, you go mad. 
It's not as easy as you think. No, to stop the work you are doing. Especially if you're a professional. Then they say all these guys who have stopped their work as engineers and as doctors and lawyers and they become their work as, they've stopped their work as farmers and they've just gone into ministry and they are preaching because they think that ministry is the easiest way of getting money. Listen, even begging is not easy. When, when you see somebody who is a beggar by the roadside, go and, go and ask them the way they suffer. The way people bypass them, say, hey, media and have it. And they are still standing there. They have to swallow their pride and keep standing there every day. Listen, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. As a pastor, one of the most difficult things to do as a pastor is receiving an offering. Anybody who is a pastor will tell you that. The preaching is quite easy. No, you, 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 you preach. You don't feel bad to do it. You raise the dead. You may be afraid, but you don't feel bad. You tell a cripple, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. You won't feel bad. You may be afraid, but an offering. You know that by the time you say offering, some are insulting you already. No, but, but you also know that if you don't raise the offering, the work of God is going to collapse. So the fear of God will let you put those insults aside and still do what you are called to do, not because you don't care about what people are saying, but the important thing is, you know what? There is a work to be done. There is a ministry work to be done. There is a poor person to look after. There is something you must do. And the thing you must do involves finances. So you know, so you know, ladies and gentlemen, so, so you know. Receiving an offering is even difficult. Generally, preaching a ministry is the most difficult thing anybody can get involved in. This my friend kept postponing until he fell sick. Then I went to visit him in the hospital and he told me something he said. But I should. When I get out of this hospital, I will go on full time. Unfortunately, he didn't get out of the hospital alive. It was his corpse we brought out of the hospital. By the time we're bringing him out of the hospital, my friend was dead. So the Bible said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable. Don't wait until your eyes are removed. You've lost one arm, you've lost one leg, until you have an ir irrecoverable sickness and then you are now saying now i have this disease which is irrecoverable i have this debilitating disease in my body so now i am giving myself to god god wanted you as a living sacrifice not as a dead sacrifice not as a sick sacrifice am i talking to somebody at all i pray in the name of jesus may the lord help us present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And I like the way the, the wise man said it in the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, the heart Kohelef. He said, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I started preaching like this when I was 21 years old. Yeah, 20. I went into full-time ministry when I was 28. 28. That's when I went into full-time ministry. And the Lord told me, stay in Bogatanga all your life. Don't move out of Bogatanga all your life. And he said, if you stay in Boga all your life, anything I would have given to you in Chicago, Anything I would have given to you in New York, anything I would have given to you in London, anything I would have given to you in Nigeria, in, in, in Abuja, in Lagos, in Accra, in Kumasi, if you stay in Bogatanga, I will give it to you there. I was, I 
was only about 21, 22, and I understood these words. Understood them. And up till today, I understand them. When I finish preaching to you this week, next week, I'm back in Borga. I'm going back where God called me. You see, uh, uh, the other day, I saw Bishop T.D. Jakes. He finished preaching somewhere, and he was going back to Dallas, and he said, Dallas is my assignment. But me, Upper East Region is my assignment. Bogatanga is my assignment. That is where I'm going. That's where I'm going. But you know, I could have decided as a young man, I want to stay in Accra and do what I want to do in Accra. Then in my old age, I will retire and go back home. In your young age, you are an asset. Then you go back to Bogatanga when you are a liability in your old age. I pray that God will help us to know what he has sent us to do. Anybody clapping, the power of God is upon you. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. The days of your life when God wants you, is the days when all your pleasures are intact. Don't wait until you have no appetite. Don't wait until the time when even the devil will not tempt you. No, 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 there are some people, even the devil at this time, the devil doesn't even want you. He will not tempt you, he will not, no. There are some, there are some of you, Satan has stopped up tempting you because uh, you are not temptable. <laughs> you are not temptable. Huh? You've lost everything. You've lost all your sensory organs for sin. All your appetites for sin, you've lost them. The natural progression of time has eroded all your appetites. So, even Satan, your name is called Obimpe, Bonsamon Sompe. Obimpe, Bonsamon Sompe. Even Satan, it means that nobody likes you. Even Satan doesn't like you. There are some of you, if they dash you to Satan, he will reject. Now, now, let me show you a mystery. Let me show you a mystery. You see the man Moses. Moses served God so well that even when he died, Satan and Michael were fighting over his body. Even in his death, his dead body was a subject of angelic contention. But look at you. You are alive. Even Satan doesn't want you. You cannot remember the last time you were tempted. Oh. There are some of you, when you are praying, you don't feel sleepy. No, no, no. When you are praying, you don't feel sleepy because the devil knows your prayers are useless. One day, one day some, somebody came to me and said, somebody came to me and said, they've lost their job. I've lost my job. I said, Satan can give you a job. They said, how? I said, if you lose your job, eh? They, no, the person came and said, the devil has made him lose his job. I said, Satan can find you a job. I said, how? I said, get up in the morning. And then you start praying from the morning to the night, morning to the night, morning to the night, morning to the night. You are praying, Rakabo, Shikebiha, Rampano Siminia, and you are holding your Bible and you are in the spirit. The devil will feel it. He will call the demons for a meeting. And he will ask them, which demon spoiled this man's work? stupid demon who says sir sir i am the one satan will say you are a fool 
find him a job immediately because when this man stopped working, he started crying. So, if you are still jobless, it may be that your prayers are not disturbing Satan. You can drop. You know, Jesus, Jesus gave a parable and said there was this wicked judge who a woman kept shouting at. He said, listen, give this woman whatever she wants. Otherwise, she's going to keep troubling me. Some of you must trouble Satan until he finds you employment. And he will find you a good job. I mean, a, a good job that will occupy you. Now, so he said, remember your creator in the days of thy youth. He said, while the sun and the light while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened nor the clouds return not after the rain can I touch on this as I close I want to keep just put this word somewhere in your spirit obedience crisis obedience crisis the obedience crisis listen we have an obedience crisis in our generation there's a lot of disobedience in the world I was thinking about obedience today disobedience today and I said that the disobedience is worse in the church because Many of the people that are disobedient in the church, they are disobedient in the name of God. All of them say the Spirit has spoken to them. Jesus said something, he said, in the last days, those who will persecute you will persecute you and they will say they did it in the name of God. It is the same way today we have a lot of rebellious and disobedient people running about the earth and saying they are obeying God. And they will quote the words of Peter, should we rather obey God or man? But the man Peter was talking about was not their head pastor. He was not their husband. He was not their master who had employed them. He was a religious leader somewhere who was persecuting the church. You cannot take what Paul told a religious, um, a religious um, fanatic somewhere. You can't take it and apply to your father, your mother, your husband, your big brother, or somebody whom God has given authority over you to. Now, watch this. You cannot quote that scripture on somebody who holds your paycheck. No, 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 no. Listen, this person puts daily bread on your table. You can't quote that scripture out there. The one Peter was talking about did not give Peter chop money. The one Peter was talking about was not the one who baptized Peter. He was not the one who ordained Peter. We have a lot of rebellion in our churches. You understand? And pastors are leading sheep who have turned into goats. Tell somebody sitting by you, are you a sheep or a goat? No, no, no. These days, these days, as pastors, we are even scared to tell our church members sit here or there. No. They'll tell you, you know, I came to this church to serve God, not you, the pastor. You, you mean you came to church to serve God, not me, the pastor. And the one you are calling the pastor, God didn't use him to form the church. Huh? Now... So, the pastor. Now, now, what is this? You are saying God called you, but the pastor, God invited him. (laughs) 
<laughs> I came to this church to serve God, but not man. Listen, one of the greatest safety measures God has put in your life is for you to know this one or two people on earth, just one or two, who if they tell you sit here, you will sit there. And if they tell you stand here, you will stand there. Listen, as long as you constitute the law in yourself, you have no future. And in the last days, the apostle Paul said something. Second Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This know also, you know, God put this word in my spirit. I knew I was going to talk about humility, but I didn't know I was going to stay on obedience until Pearl, I got up from that nap. Because in that nap, I saw a man talking to me. I just told my wife, I want to close my eyes for 15 minutes. And when I did, a man was talking to me. And all he was talking to me was obedience. And I said, oh, I love Reverend Whitcomb. This is the first time he's inviting me. If I preach that message there, I will never get another invitation. <laughs> the members are going to him and tell him, what did you bring here? <laughs> we thought you were bringing us a man who come and talk about the spirit and the, and the power of God and so on. No, we will get into that tomorrow night. But today, let's build a platform. Let's build a platform. Let's build a platform. Let's build a platform. Mm -hmm. So Paul told Timothy, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall come. Stay right there. Straight there. Stay there. Perilous time shall come. And I know when it says perilous time shall come, people are thinking it, it's a day of witchcraft, it's a day of divination, it's a day of occultism, and demons are going to be flying all over the place. And then, you know, whenever we talk about bad things and bad signs of the end time, we are looking at demonic forces. But everything Paul is about to talk about the perilous times are sociological problems. Issues that have to do with society. Our existence with one another. You know there are times he talks about doctrines of devils. But here he's just talking about the perilous times. He's talking about just human behavior. When I look at this thing about the perilous times. All I'm seeing is an obedience crisis. Obedience crisis, where disobedience has become so prevalent among people, and everything is just rebellion. Perilous such a time shall come. Verse number two For men shall be lovers of their own selves, where they take decisions, and the decisions are just what will make them happy. No matter what, no, they don't think about you. He's thinking about himself as the employer, he's, as the employee. He's not thinking about you as the employer. Nobody's walking about thinking, oh, this decision I'm going to take, oh, how will it affect my wife? How will it affect my children? How will it affect the church? I've decided to leave the church, but how is it going to affect another person? He's thinking about me. I've been in cases when we are dealing with marriage and the woman or the man will ask me, Daddy, what about me? Uh, and they'll tell you, God said, love your neighbor as yourself, not more than yourself. <laughs> Stupid interpretation of a good scripture. If you can clap, you get out of stupidity and start walking in obedience. Come on, scream like your voice is lost. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. Covetous. Everything is about what they can get in life. 
They want some money. They want some job. They want some, some covetous. They, they, they want something. They want some qualification. They want to improve on themselves. Huh? Sometimes they even want to improve on their body shape. So they have to go and cut themselves up. Then they tell you, I went for a procedure. I went under the knife. Very soon, people will go to the Mayanka, the butcher shop. In, in, in uh, I, don't, I don't know what. Where, 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 where is the slaughterhouse in Accra, the big one? What is the name of that? Graphic Road? Or they moved from there. They used to move, be at Graphic Road. Very soon, so some of you will go to Graphic Road and tell them to cut your stomach. The place where they butcher the cows and the sheep. Huh? Covetous. Boosters. Proud. Blasphemous. Watch this one. Disobedient to parents. Listen, anybody you are not prepared to obey, never call them your father or your mother. If you know you cannot obey, don't call them your father or your mother. Your father or your mother is not somebody who makes you feel good. Is somebody who makes you uncomfortable. That person who tells you, sit here, you sit here. Stand there, you stand there. Do this and you do that. And until they have given you permission, you are not doing it. Now someone said, no, 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 no. That person is going to control me. The Bible said, even Jesus, he left his father and mother and was preaching. And the father and mother caught up with him and they said, why? He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? But he followed them back home. And the Bible said that when he followed them back home, he was now subject unto his father and mother. That, does it mean the first one was a mistake? It was not a mistake. He realized he had to have a balance. You are doing your father's business, but here is your biological father and your biological mother. No, you must be subject to them too because your father is in heaven, but the shame concerning your birth is not your father in heaven who was shamed. It was this your mother on earth who was carrying a pregnancy and could, could not tell anybody anything. All he could say is that, you know, Holy Ghost came upon me and Joseph is walking about with the shame of this pregnancy does not belong to me, but the pregnancy belongs to God. And, and Joseph has to explain something he couldn't explain. And Mary has to explain something she couldn't explain. And you are walking about there. And you have abandoned them. You are not thinking about them. The Bible said he was subject unto his parents. Listen to me. Your father and your mother, they went through something to bring you to where you are. And here are people, lovers of themselves, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents. Watch this one, unthankful, unthankful, ungrateful, unholy. Three, without natural affection. Look at you. The, the difference between you and a brute beast is not there. You are so callous. You've lost every human feeling. Truce breakers. Truce breakers are common cost, uh, covenant breakers. People that break the law. Huh? People that break the law false accusers and when they break the law and they jump out of the church they will tell everybody what was not true false accusers you know we, they did what they know is bad but they must let somebody else look bad incontinent fierce despises of those that are good traitors heavy high-minded Heavy, high-minded, no humility, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. 
having the form of godliness and that is exactly who we are we say in the name of god we speak in tongues in our disobedience you find us and all the tongues is just a pretense and a facade to our wickedness and our rebellion we just want to do bad things but we use the name of god to do the bad things and the bible said thou shalt not take the name of the lord thy god in vain anybody that can scream you are putting away the disobedience having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof he said from such turn away there are many of the friends you have you don't need them there are many of the friends you have you must say bye bye to them there are many of the friends you have you must say no more. There are many of the WhatsApp platforms and WhatsApp groups you belong to. You must exit the group from tonight because those groups are just groups of rebellion. They are groups of ingratitude. They are groups of unholiness. And I see you coming out of them. Why? Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the word of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Wherefore, come out from among them and be a separate and touch not the unclean thing. Come on, scream like your voice is yours. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, we so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your mind. My last scripture, Titus 2, from verse 1. Titus 2, from verse 1. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Speak the things that become sound doctrine. What is the sound doctrine? Verse 2. Yesterday we were doing doctrine we were in our Bible school called the Pneuma Institute. We were doing Bible and they were talking about doctrine and talking about Christology and talking about theology and, and talking about um, um, Hamashiology and talking about all those things, the logic, the logic, the logic, and everything, doctrine, the doctrine of the Bible and the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of man, anthropology, and so on and so forth. But one thing about doctrine is human behavior. So Paul is talking to Timothy and to Titus, and what he's telling them is our human behavior constitute a body of doctrine he says speak sound doctrine to the people speak sound doctrine i know you like teachings on angelology demonology pneumatology huh? satanology but let me talk to you about behaviorology or behaviorology, Beha behaviorology, behaviorology. Sasu ba imboni amudi na mose yeye nyamie chumano. Bad behavior. 
We are doing the work of God. You know, the other day I was with my son, Angus. And Angus told me he's working somewhere. And he told me, he said, Daddy, I'm going to take permission from work and I'll see you by 4 p.m. I said, Angus, you are not coming to me until you close. And you cannot leave your place of work until your boss leaves. I said, I'll be here waiting for you. Stay with them until you finish. He said, okay, then I'll give them, I'll take permission for tomorrow so that tomorrow I can come to you early. I said, no way. I, I said, you know what? You don't want to be the kind of worker who takes permission before closing. Stay there. It's a discipline you have to learn. I taught one of my grandsons, who is about, how old is Ruru? He's four years. I saw him a few months ago in May. And I told him, I'm giving you two words. Put them in your spirit, never forget. I told him, discipline, self-control. Discipline, self-control. And I said, Roro, say after me, discipline, self-control. He said, discipline, self-control. Discipline, self-control. Recently, the dad or the mom told mommy and said that. He told them, say, I want to tell you the thing grandpa taught me. They said, what did grandpa teach? He said, grandpa told me discipline, self-control. He has put them in his spirit. <laughs> discipline, self-control. This is the sound doctrine. This is the sound doctrine. That the aged men should be sober. That means aged men in the church. Stop drinking bubura apetashi. Stop drinking wine in the name of it is good for your heart. Be sober. Not under the influence of any influencing agent. Be grave, be temperate, sound in faith and in charity and patient. These are the qualities of an old man. So sometimes, instead of busy dyeing your hair, imbibe these qualities as an old man. Instead of putting this dye on your hair, put these things in your head. As you forgive them. <laughs> Can you imagine all the effort you are using to dye your hair if you used to put these things inside the head? So what is on the head is not as important as what is in the head. Oh. I have, I have, I have, an, I have a, a friend of mine who is an old man, and he's old like me. Whenever he sees me, he said, Daddy, won't you do something about this, your gray hair? And I told him, no. I tell him, I, I like it. And I said, well, as for him, he's doing something about his. And, and the interesting thing about his own is that sometimes he will dye it until even the skull is black. Don't worry, some old men are saying, as you get out of this topic, get out of there, get out of there. They are binding me and casting me out. Okay, I cast myself out. I cast myself out. And the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming holiness. That means aged woman, even if you are single, by the age of 55, 60, your husband has gone. Don't go and look for a 28-year-old man to warm your bed. In the name of he's my driver. He's just a security person. He just helps me with the laundry. And the laundry includes your body. Oh, the room is becoming quiet. And the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming, becoming holiness. 
not false accusers. Because, oh, aged women, sometimes when they are idle, they can talk about things which don't exist. Gossip. Not giving too much wine. Teachers of good things. That they may teach the younger women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children. So these older women, he says, let them be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Okay, no, no. Verse 4. That they may teach the younger women. So now I'm talking about the younger women, okay. So the younger women, this is what they are supposed to be taught. That they should be sober, not clubbing. Mm, not clubbing. Because there are married younger women who still go clubbing. Three people are clapping. And to love their husbands. Because as a younger woman, once in a while, you see some men who are more cute than your husband. You are, you are younger woman, you are 35. Your husband is about 37. What is your husband? Unfortunately, he works like a school teacher. <laughs> now, you are going to a place of work and you are working at. Um, what are the places where they have cute young men who work? You, you are working at um, National, what, what, what is the name of the, the Communications Authority? NCN. You are now working at MTN, and you have all these young men who come here, hey, hello, how are you? And then, they, and then you compare them with your husband. Because your husband is a believer, he's a Christian, and he's holding, always holding the Bible. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor standeth in the seat of God. And you see, your husband has never been to London. He's never been to America. So every morning when he gets up, um, Efia, how are you, Efia? If you are, I'm going to work to come. I love you. Eh? They say, okay, I see, I see. But you now go to work, and this, this guy has been in London, he's been to America. And they, hey, baby, how you doing? He didn't say, if you're a baby. And you two, you are standing there. Hey, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oof. To love their husbands, whether their husbands are outmoded, whether they are like the phone they call yam, or they are a smartphone, or smart television. Just love your husband. Because every now and then, you see these men who are sharp. Oh, and their tongues are more slippery than Satan. Hey, you appear not they look at you, they say, man. <laughs> Meanwhile, when you left, your husband said nothing. So every day you get up in the morning and you are dressing for somebody at work instead of the man in your house. Somebody's guilty here, so I have to come here. I have to come here. They should love their husbands and love their children. That 
means there should not be women who lock up their children in a room alone and jump out of the house to go and meet a boyfriend with a drinking joint. And I'm telling you people, these things are not just in the world. They are in the church. They are in desert pastures and they may be in Agape house. Not at all. What, one is standing behind you. You'll be sitting, standing there saying, not at all. <laughs> now watch this one. Now watch this one. Now, now. There should be discreet, chest, keepers at home. Good. Now this is the one I just want to talk about. Obedient to their own husbands. Obedient. No, no, no. This word is almost blasphemous these days. A woman to obey a husband. I'm not saying men should be bullies. Obedient to their husbands. Watch this. That the word of God be not blasphemed. You see, all this disobedience and arrogance, men abusing women, killing women, mutilating them, and so on and so forth, because the men too can be callous in the way they treat women. All these things are making the word of God, they are bringing the word of God to disrepute. Verse number six, young men likewise, we are now on the young men. The young men thought I had closed. Not so fast, not so fast, not so fast. The young men likewise be sober. Stop smoking weed. You are talking to a young man. By the time you realize he's making. It means Emranasu. That was our quibi. Many of our young men, or some of our young men, are alcoholics. No, and they are addicted to strange drugs. Sexually, they can control themselves. They sleep with anybody, anything, and anyhow. They are married, you can't trust them with a sister. Even if it's their wife's sister. Sober. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. And in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. Gravity. Sincerity. Look at many of our young men. Many of our young men, they borrow your money, they will not pay. They are owing in a church. And when they see they are owing in one church, they jump to another church. And go and continue the borrowing spree. Sound speech. That cannot be condemned. He, that he, that is of the contrary part, may be ashamed. Having no evil thing to say of you. Verse number nine. Exhort the servants to be obedient unto their own masters. And to please them well in all things, not answering again. Show the servants to stop talking back at their masters. They should be obedient, behaving well, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. I pray. May we imbibe the spirit of humility. May we imbibe the spirit of humility. Lift up your hand and talk to God. Mm, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his way, what a glory he sheds all on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will 
trust and obey. So trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So trust and obey. For there's no way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust. Uh, Lift up your hand and talk to God. Obedience. Yada mahakatabala la basia. Father, teach us obedience. Mm-hmm. But to trust and obey. So trust and obey. For as all. Say this after me, Heavenly Father. I pray for the spirit of obedience, the spirit of humility. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you teach me the ways of humility. Grant unto me the grace to hear, to hear swiftly, that I may do the things that please you. And the things that glorify your name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.